come to uh, Utah to uh, look at the Ultimate Browning Double Auto Collection. My friend Bruce uh, lives in, uh, in uh, Utah, and he he has the I, I, I call it the ultimate collection because no one anywhere has what he has because he was personal friends with Val Browning, who I never met when I, he didn't ever come to Arnold that I know, not when I was there, but so I never met, mm -hmm. never met Val, never did, but you knew him, you were his paper boy. Yeah, well that's true. Through, through papers out in his driveway, with, and he's a tipper. Yeah, you tipper. got it. So why did he like you? I don't know why you're... Well, I think the first connection that I had, he, his offices were in his first security bank building in Ogden, and that was across the street from where my dad had a drugstore. It was a soda fountain, and Val would come over there occasionally and, you know, probably every morning or at least when he was in the office and have coffee or a sandwich and stuff. And at the time, I had a paper route in Ogden, and Val's residence was on my paper route. And so it was kind of a, he, quite a, I mean, just really a neat guy. And so every day when I bring him his paper, I had to pump down a lane to where his house was. And he'd most of the time be out on the porch waiting for the paper. And the story was that he'd get his paper and, and uh, get a highball or whatever and go down and sit in his backyard where the little stream went through his yard yeah. and read the paper. Yeah. And uh, so, I had this paper route for a couple of years, and uh, every Christmas, he would, when I deliver his paper to him, he'd say, hey, uh, Merry Christmas, and you have a nice Christmas, and hand me a $20 bill. Kind of like a Christmas gift, and at that time, well, back now in the, you know, in the 50s, yeah, yeah. that he, that was like a young guy getting a $100 bill today. It was a big bucks. Yeah, it was big bucks, <laughs> and that kind of funded my Christmas fund for my family and so on and so forth and uh, so anyway uh, about October one year I decided to move on to bigger and better things and give up the paper route but I really hated to give up that $20 bill that was going to come in December if I was still there so I told the boy that took over the route from me I says uh, you know what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to bring Mr. Brian's paper on Christmas Eve didn't say anything about the twenty dollars, and uh, this boy, well, that's okay with me. So on Christmas Eve that year, we met up the top of the lane, and I took the bags off his bike, put them on my bike, and pumped down to give Valley's paper, and hopefully get this twenty dollars tip that I get every Christmas. And when I got down there, he he was just, I mean, this guy is a gentleman beyond belief. But when I got down there, I, you know, Merry Christmas for Brian, had him his newspaper. And he hadn't seen me for a while, so he stopped me and he says, hey, wait a minute, hold up a minute. And I thought, uh oh, I got a problem. And he said to me, he says, uh, where you been? And I thought, well, I better just lay the whole story out because he knew my dad and goes over there for coffee. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't, you know, be perfectly honest with him. So I told him, I says, well, I give up the paper route, and, uh, but I wanted to come down on Christmas and wish him Merry Christmas. Well, he knew I'd down there to get the $20 as much as wish, wish him Merry Christmas. So anyway, he says, well, where's that other boy that's been bringing me my paper for the last few months? And I says, well, Mr. Browning, uh, he's up the top of the lane. And uh, he says, go get him. I thought, oh, man. I've got myself into a deal now. So I go up and get this other boy, and of course he doesn't know what's going on. And we get down there, he said, now let me get this straight. He says, you brought me my paper until October. He says, but October, November, and December, this other lad brought my paper down. He says, I'm that kind of a story. And I'm, well, yeah. And he, I could see a little smirk on his face. And he says, you guys just wait here a minute, and I'll be back. So apparently he went in the house and took the $20 bill and changed it into a 10 and two fives. He came back out and he says, now I'm going over the story again. And I says, yeah. And he says, uh, so actually the way I look at it, he says, you've got $15 coming because you brought it down for nine months. <laughs> and he says, but this boy's entitled to a little Christmas gift because he brought it the last three months. 
I says, yeah. And this kid, he's just kind of looking like, what the heck's going on here? Because he wasn't used to the $20 tip. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he gives me $15 and gives this other boy five or 20 bucks. And then he looked me right and straight in the eye, and you could just tell he was having fun with this deal. And he just said, you got any problem with that? Oh, no. I thought, man, I'm not stirring nothing up. I won't get nothing. So I said, no, that's fine. And so he gives a $5 bill to this other boy and 15 and wishes us Merry Christmas. And away we went. But uh, I'm sure he went in the house and just laughed about giving these two boys their first economic lesson, yeah. economics 101 on, on Christmas Eve. But that was kind of the way... Well, so, that, so you knew him from the paper, so how did you, after the paper out was all, how did you stay in contact with him? Well, I mean, obviously you guys must have been pretty good friends for him to do. Well, not really. He yeah. knew who I was, and he knew my dad, but, and I, and, and I wish I'd have stayed in contact with him better before he passed away. He would have been then, you know, in his late 80s, and I wish I would have at the time, at the time I wasn't collecting guns. You know, I was, yeah. you know, 14 years old, yeah. Yeah. and so I always kept in touch with the family and and uh, with him, knew who he was, and then later on I bought, the first shotgun I ever bought was a double auto. I shoot left-handed, and so it was kind of a nice gun yeah. for that Sweet. reason, yeah. and it was pretty inexpensive. At the time, in the yeah. 50s, you know, those guns only sold for, I think, the First price she was like sixty seven dollars and fifty cents. Brand new, oh, full yeah. retail, brand yeah. new. Oh, yeah. yeah, and so uh, that was, and then from then on, you know, I of course never bought anything but brownies just because of the fact that the history and living in Ogden yeah. and, and yeah. you know, you got to buy a brownie. Right? Oh yeah, I mean, it was traitorous to wear it the way, oh, even yeah. though half the other guns <laughs> had brownie patents on them. Always had brownie guns, and then that just led to. Uh, in fact, the first one I bought, I bought from uh, 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 a tire dealer at the time and had a tire shop, J.W. Brewer Tire, and he was also a Browning dealer at the time. And uh, I bought my first gun from him and he let me, I, then I ended up being a delivery boy for a parts store, which I ended up making a career of. And uh, he kind of gave me terms on it and I can remember oh. trying to get it out of hock by the yeah. time pheasant season started. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, now Val, Val designed the gun. He, he and the absolutely. and the team there in in Morgan, they designed it. Yeah, that was his, his well, gun from start to finish. A lot of well, things he finished when John and when his dad died. You know, like yeah. the super pose, he continued with yeah. that. But the double auto was his. It was his all the way. He just. That was the deal. He just felt a lot of people didn't like the idea of a two shot, but he kind of felt like he kind of did a lot of it for the European market, and felt like if you don't get your yeah. game in two shots, that's all you need. You don't need five. And you know, later on, as everybody knows, like with the five shot, they yeah. plugged those guns so they'd only hold three shell yeah. legally. Oh, yeah. You know oh, what sure. I mean yeah. when you're out in the duck marsh. Yeah. But uh, he and he was working on those guns, and and making improvements in them right up to his death. In huh. fact, I got a lot of stuff that uh, came out of his workshop that I got from his grandson when they when he passed away and they emptied it and he was still playing around with things like rubber grommets and the oh. pistol to make the recoil a little softer. Oh yeah, yeah. He just he was just devoted to that. Well, yeah. Gun and he, he just did so, a lot of things nobody else did, like the colors and you know different things like that. So when did they start making the double auto? When they discontinued? I know they made what fifty eight thousand or something. Yeah, sixty seven thousand. Yeah, 67, and, and that's an that's an estimate. They don't quite. They estimate sixty six to sixty seven thousand. They don't have exact production numbers. That, when did they stop production on them? Seventy one. Seventy one. Oh, that's when they had the flat knob stocks. Yeah, they made a few of them. They started in fifty two. And of course, you know, they made the steel ones, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they started making the, it's not actually aluminum, it's called hydro, I can't even pronounce it half the time, uh, tongue twister, hydro aluminum, it's an aircraft uh, aluminum. I just refer to it as strong. aluminum alloy. But, yeah, it is. Uh, but that's the proper name for it. I, I, uh, yeah, it started with an egg, hydro aluminum or something like that, which was a real high strength aluminum that he used for you know, the receivers, and of course all the barrels were steel. And he started with the uh, 
a steel one, and then uh, and after that they made what was considered to start with a lightweight, and that was the you know the aluminum receiver, and then that migrated into a 12 at, they call them 12 ats, mm -hmm. and then the 20 weights, which were just an ounce or two lighter, and then they stayed with just quit making the steel ones and just made the aluminum ones from uh, yeah. Until we ended production, like was in '71. And we were still servicing those things in uh, the Arnold facility, and I guess they service them for what another ten years. I guess I guess they have to, or they're kind of obligated to carry parts and service for ten years. You know, one time I could have swore, and I could be mistaken, I say that they had a pink one in the shop that they were servicing or something. And, but then again, I, I don't remember. But they get uh, they we had one guy that worked on us. All he did all day long was A fives and double logs, A fives double logs. But maybe they were just talking about the pink one. But you've got the pink one. We're going yeah, to show. I've, yeah, I've got. Which is which is at least the only one I know of that ended up uh, going to in, uh, to a, a daughter-in-law of one of the guys that worked there in Arnold that that Art didn't know. Lloyd Gasford yeah. ended up, and kind of a story behind that that I'll get to. But what Val did is that he made a lot of different colors, just samples like. And at the time, the two biggest Browning dealers in the country were Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward. This is before the mm, Cabela's yeah, yeah. of the world and Sportsman's right. wore out. All those you guys came along. Mail order guns, thing. I'm not sure. Exactly. Yeah. And anyway, he sent them out to, and uh, to just see what the public thought of them. And uh, this gun store manager or something at Sears called Val up, and he says, uh, you know. I just, my manager bought, got a bunch of these odd colored guns here. And Val says, well, I, we wanted to kind of get a flow of uh, what the public thought and what was the most popular color and so on and so forth. That, and this guy says, well, come and get these things. He says, no man wants a red gun or a pink gun or a blue gun to go out in the field with yeah. his buddies pheasant hunting yeah. with. He wants a black but he's gun. He's going to laugh at him at a blue yeah. gun. Oh, Joe's got a pink gun. Oh, Joe's got all about? a red, red gun with him today. Yeah, yeah. they got a red gun or well, a blue gun or something. Well, forget it. We don't want any part of those. Exactly. So what Val do then? Kind of. Well, he told this Lloyd that he told this guy to send the guns back to Arnold and to just put black receivers on them and send them back to him because the guy just wanted the black ones. So he did that, and when he came in, he said to Val, he says, well, with serial numbers on them and that, what do you want me to do with these receivers? I'm going to re take off and replace with black ones. And Val said, just cut them up in a bandsaw. Hmm. And so he did. Quite a, I don't know how many and how many different colors was it at the time, but there was two of them that I happened to end up with that he couldn't make himself cut them out. Bring himself to one of them he gave this pink one to his daughter-in-law, <laughs> and the other one he kept just the receiver, and it was a two-tone blue one, which I happened to have. I've got those two guns from him, one from his daughter-in-law and uh, ex-daughter-in-law. She and his son got divorced, and I had to track her down, and so on and so forth. And uh, so then after that, the story is up in Morgan. He passed some guns out in the lunchroom up there and asked the people what colors they thought would be the most popular and and most accepted in the market and everything. And they came back. Of course, the black one was the most sought after at the yeah, time. It was the gold engraving. Yeah, yeah. And then he they made he did a forest green one. Yeah. It was a green receiver with silver engraving. A uh, autumn brown one that was silver engraved, kind of a light brown. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course they did quite a few of them in silver so, over yeah. the years. So at the end of the production, when they actually went into production, you could buy a black one, a green one, a uh, uh, autumn brown one, and of course the dragon black one and the silver one. Those are the only ones that actually... Mm -hmm. so, so the story is they just kind of well, they had like a little focus group meeting or something, and exactly, well, that's why here's I what we're, you know, and here's what we're proposing, and they just picked out those four. Yeah, and those colors they thought would be the most, you know, sought so, after so, or uh, accepted by the yeah. General. So the red ones and the blue ones, how many are in existence then? 
you got well, all I've seen. Well, on the blue ones, uh, I think maybe the only two that I'm aware of are the two I've got. The two-tone blue one that I related the story to, and then I've got a blue one with a blue barrel. And the red ones kind of same thing? Or only same a type of, of a thing? deal with red These ones. are just I, prototypes. Yeah, it, yeah, they are all prototype, but they're... I, I've, but they're working guns. Oh, yeah. They're working guns. They're just, and then he also thought maybe a good idea would be to have colored barrels to go along with the colored receivers. So, to my knowledge, there's just very few of those, and the only ones that are actually documented is well, he had them, of course, they were all made in Belgium, and he had five guns sent to him in Ogden to his office with colored barrels on them. And there's, you know, steel barrels with a two. Yeah, with an aluminum sleeve on it. Right. Right. Yeah. And he sent a red one, a blue one, an autumn brown one, a green one, and a silver one. Those four guns. And I've got the invoice that actually mm. came with the guns that were sent to him, a copy of it. Mm. And I ended up, over the years, from some of the ex-Browning presidents that they found them in closets oh. and stuff, I ended up uh, with the blue one, the red one, and the silver one. The green one is in the museum in Ogden, and the autumn brown one is still within the Browning family. His son, Val's son, John Val, he says that when those barrels came in, then they start testing them, and there was a problem with, I don't know whether it's discoloration or breaking down or whatever, because of the heat mm -hmm. on the barrels, and their legal department told them that's just yeah. You're opening yourself up uh -huh. a can of worms, so they never did manufacture huh. the barrels and uh, the colors other than yeah. those few. That are, and they're the only five that I'm aware of, other than another story is he did start producing very few 20 gauges and never got. Yeah, you told me the other day you had some 20s. I said they didn't make 20. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everybody tells me that. He's got them. But I've got a couple of 20 gauges, and they got different compensators on them. And, Val just, uh, I wish it, before he passed away, I would have, and I could have done it, and just never did do it, actually go out and spend some time with the man, yeah. talking about yeah. it, get more, you know, because yeah. it's been interesting. I'd, I'd have a lot more stories of the paper books. Like, I, like I regret not talking to my grandparents a little like I should have, or asking my dad more about exactly. World War II, and, and yeah. then wonder, when they're gone, then it's Hindsight. like, you know, why didn't, why didn't I take that opportunity, now they're gone. But they made them in all types of, you know, he had, you know, there's skeet guns and then he did a, a, a trap stock, very few trap, trap stock. They did a, I've seen the white beaver tail form. Yeah. Some of those, I've got some. I have one in the shop now. Yeah. And there are few and far between those type of guns. But he, uh, uh, he also, you know, you, most barrel configurations you could get, you know, I mean, everything from, you know, skeet to, to, you know, full modified, whatever you wanted. Yeah, oh yeah. You could order the oh, guns with the oh, yeah, get improved cylinder, sure. whatever. So ribs, there was a lot channel of ribs, plain. Buck barrels. Buck barrels. Not a lot of those. Don't see many of those. Barrel. I don't know if I've ever seen a buck barrel. I've got, I've I've got some buck barrels. And uh, so, you know, sometimes it's a lot of, like a lot of things that you collect. It's the people you meet along the yeah, way, yeah. and sometimes it's a it, 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 chase. It's a chase. Yeah, it's a it. chase. It's exactly right. It, that's, it, that's what that's what goes. And during that chase, you, that's right. you meet a lot of that's nice right. people, and that's you get right. a lot of memories from it. Yeah, it's actually we, worth more we, we, after you get it. The excitement's right. over. We get we get real obsessed, you know. Yeah. And then we that right. and then we you know it's just it's, we eat and sleep that. That's what we we dream. Of. I know a lot of yeah. those guys believe. Well, yeah, this just happens to be a gun that. Uh, I sent the uh, barrel and the uh, receiver to Angelo B, and uh, uh, he designed what the pattern that's on it, and uh, put a little gold ring on the barrel, and so on and so forth, and did a little engraving on the top of the barrel, and just uh, uh, just a beautiful gun. That uh, two particular guns. The story behind them is Val at the time uh, two of the bigger. Browning dealers were uh, Sears and Roebucks and Montgomery Wards before all these specialty sports stores and so on and so forth. And so 
the gun manager, there's one particular, I think it was, the, I don't know if it's Sears or Montgomery Ward, they sent some guns to him to get just the general public's opinion of them. And this pink one here and this uh, blue one were two of those guns. From what Lloyd tells me, who was working for Brian at the time, there was at least a half a dozen of these guns, all different colors and so on and so forth. And finally the manager called up at the store and says, come and get these guns. Nobody wants a pink gun to go out and shoot and duck with their buddy with. And that, and so he, uh, you know, told Val that, and Val called Lloyd and says, uh, they're going to send those guns back, or you're going to pick them up, or I don't know exactly how they got back to Lloyd, and just restock them with black re black receivers, and just use the stocks and everything. And, and Lloyd says, well, you know, because of the serial numbers and everything, what do you want me to do with the guns that are, uh, you know, the receivers I'm taking off? And Val told him, he says, well, Hell, just run them through a bandsaw and throw them away, <laughs> rather than putting new wood on them, going through all this stuff. And it was an Arnold, and so he did it just exactly that, except for these, this blue one and this pink one. And he told me that I just couldn't bring myself to cut them up, and so I thought the pink one would be perfect to give to my daughter-in-law, his son's wife, which he did. Later, they got divorced, and I ended up buying it from this lady that his son was you know, married to. And the blue one, he just had the receiver at his home, no stock on it or anything. Of course, the stock that went with it was, you know, I put a black receiver on it and sent it back. So I just found a stock and uh, and stocked it. And this is the original stock and everything on the pink one. And this one's got a buck barrel on it. I, I made, because they did make a few and they're kind of hard to come by too nowadays, but they did make buck barrels. Hard to find. Yeah. yeah and that's so, uh, so the sad part about it is there's another four different colored ones that got oh. cut up and ended yeah. up in a garbage can somewhere. Unfortunately, according to Lloyd, that's what he did with yeah. them. So. I know I saw this one in Arnold because I started working there in 71. Yeah. And it was in 71, 72. Lloyd had it down there. At the, uh, I'm positive down in his office and guys in the shop are saying, see that pink double auto Lloyd's got? No, I like to see it. I mean, I know it's, I'm sure that's the gun I saw. Well, well, this gun is number 10, and the individual pieces, even the barrel has got little 10 stamped on it, so I don't know what, being the serial numbers 10, maybe they were hand-fitted when they were still playing around with them, but I got it from Chris Ford, a good friend of mine, whose father, Hugh Ford, was on the board of directors at Browning years ago. He's passed away now, and uh, I acquired it from Chris, and uh, it's got a little it's additional just, engraving. It's got a little additional uh -huh. engraving, and of course, being the number 10. Yeah. And uh, there's another fellow here in town that's a Browning descendant uh, that uh, has also got Any number 8. is engraved on the receiver, not over the loading port. Uh -huh. It's actually in the engraving. I'll be. 20 weight. Hmm. Huh. And then it's got the Broadway rib yeah. on Yeah. Well, I don't know. We, we, there's a lot of moonlighters in that Arnold shop, and uh, and uh, we tinkered with a lot of things. And someone maybe in the uh, the uh, Arnold uh, gunsmithing facility might have been kind of tinkering. Hard to say. Yeah, I don't know. Hard to say. I don't know. I it's just it's, it's a different deal. But that, you know, the engraving is you know it's similar kind of on this side. Standard. But on this side, yeah, they've written twenty weight yeah. in the yeah. engraving. That's odd. Different. That's odd. That, that's the story behind it we'll never know. Yeah. Where it came from. Well, the hand another one. We hope you enjoyed the video. video. We call that the, the greatest Browning Double Auto video collection. It's what we're going to call this video. And we think it lives up to the title. Uh, Bruce was, a special thank you to Bruce. He was very kind to have us into his home, show us his private collection. Uh, we do appreciate him doing that. Utah was a gorgeous state. I forgot how pretty that state was. All the mountains were still snow capped. Uh, Salt Lake City was just a gorgeous area. Uh, while we're out there, we did swing by the museum. I've got a video coming up on the museum. They were kind enough to let us do some filming there. We've also got the Winchester 21, the Angelo B video, the Colt 1903 video. As soon as it gets back from Ray, we're going to wrap that thing up. So we got a ton of stuff coming up. Uh, we're working on it. We've only got so many hours in the day with all the work pouring in here. Uh, 
again, thank you for watching. This is like I said, this was Bruce's private collection, so please don't try to reach out to him and buy it. I don't think he'd part with it anyway. He enjoys it way too much. Uh, hope you enjoyed.